Question 31 of Summa Theologica Pars Prima Trinity and Creation. Summa Theologica Pars Prima Trinity and Creation by St. Thomas Aquinas. Question 31. Of what belongs to the unity or plurality in God? We now consider what belongs to the unity or plurality in God, which gives rise to four points of inquiry. Concerning the word Trinity, whether we can say that the Son is other than the Father, whether an exclusive term which seems to exclude otherness can be joined to an essential name in God, and whether it can be joined to a personal term. First article, whether there is Trinity in God. Objection 1. It would seem that there is not Trinity in God, for every name in God signifies substance or relation. But this name Trinity does not signify the substance, otherwise it would be predicated of each one of the persons. Nor does it signify relation, for it does not express a name that refers to another. Therefore the word Trinity is not to be applied to God. Objection 2. Further, this word Trinity is a collective term, since it signifies multitude. But such a word does not apply to God, as the unity of a collective name is the least of unities, whereas in God there exists the greatest possible unity. Therefore, this word Trinity does not apply to God. Objection 3. Further, every trine is threefold, but in God there is not triplicity, since triplicity is a kind of inequality. Therefore, neither is there Trinity in God. Objection 4. Further, all that exists in God exists in the unity of the divine essence, because God is his own essence. Therefore, if Trinity exists in God, it exists in the unity of the divine essence, and thus in God there would be three essential unities, which is heresy. And objection 5. Further, in all that is said of God, the concrete is predicated of the abstract. For deity is God and paternity is the father but the trinity cannot be called trine otherwise there would be nine realities in god which of course is erroneous therefore the word trinity is not to be applied of god on the contrary athanasius says unity in trinity and trinity in unity is to be revered i answer that the name trinity in god signifies the determinate number of persons and so the plurality of persons in God requires that we should use the word trinity because what is indeterminately signified by plurality is signified by trinity in a determinate manner. Reply to Objection 1. In its etymological sense, this word trinity seems to signify the one essence of the three persons according as trinity may mean trine unity but in the strict meaning of the term it rather signifies the number of persons of one essence and on this account we cannot say that the father is the trinity as he is not three persons yet it does not mean the relations themselves of the persons but rather the number of persons related to each other and hence it is that the word in itself does not express regard to another reply to objection two two things are implied in a collective term plurality of the supposita and a unity of some kind of order for people is a multitude of men comprehended under a certain order in the first sense this word trinity is like other collective words but in the second sense it differs from them because in the divine trinity not only is there unity of order but also with this there is unity of essence reply to objection three trinity is taken in an absolute sense for it signifies the threefold number of persons triplicity signifies a proportion of inequality for it is a species of unequal proportion according to boethius therefore in god there is not triplicity but trinity reply to objection four in the divine trinity is to be understood both number and the persons numbered so when we say trinity in unity we do not place number in the unity of the essence as if we meant three times one but we place the persons numbered in the unity of nature as the supposita of a nature are said to exist in that nature on the other hand we say unity in trinity meaning that the nature is in its supposita 
Reply to Objection 5. When we say Trinity is trine, by reason of the number implied, we signify the multiplication of that number by itself, since the word trine imports a distinction in the supposita of which it is spoken. Therefore it cannot be said that the Trinity is trine, otherwise it follows that if the Trinity be trine, there would be three supposita of the Trinity. As when we say God is trine, it follows that there are three supposita of the Godhead. Second article, whether the Son is other than the Father. Objection 1. It would seem that the Son is not other than the Father. For other is a relative term implying diversity of substance. If then the Son is other than the Father, he must be different from the Father, which is contrary to what Augustine says, that when we speak of three persons, we do not mean to imply diversity. Objection 2. Further, whosoever are other from one another differ in some way from one another. Therefore, if the Son is other than the Father, it follows that he differs from the Father, which is against what Ambrose says, that the Father and the Son are one in Godhead. Nor is there any difference in substance between them, nor any diversity. Objection 3. Further, the term alien is taken from alius. But the Son is not alien from the Father, for Hilary says that in the divine persons there is nothing diverse, nothing alien, nothing separable. Therefore the Son is not other than the Father. Objection 4. Further, the terms other person and other thing have the same meaning, differing only in gender. So if the Son is another person from the Father, it follows that the Son is a thing apart from the Father. On the contrary, Augustine says, there is one essence of the Father and Son and Holy Ghost, in which the Father is not one thing, the Son another, and the Holy Ghost another. Although the Father is one person, the Son another, and the Holy Ghost another. I answer that since, as Jerome marks, a heresy arises from words wrongly used, when we speak of the Trinity, we must proceed with care and with befitting modesty. Because, as Augustine says, nowhere is error more harmful, the quest more toilsome, the finding more fruitful. Now, in treating of the Trinity, we must beware of two opposite errors and proceed cautiously between them. Namely, the error of Arius, who placed a trinity of substance with the trinity of persons, and the error of Sabellius, who placed unity of person with the unity of essence. Thus, to avoid the error of Arius, we must shun the use of the terms diversity and difference in God, lest we take away the unity of essence. We may, however, use the term distinction on account of the relative opposition. Hence, whenever we find terms of diversity or difference of persons used in an authentic work, these terms of diversity or difference are taken to mean distinction. But lest the simplicity and singleness of the divine essence be taken away, the terms separation and division, which belong to the parts of a whole, are to be avoided. And lest quality be taken away, we avoid the use of the term disparity. And lest we remove similitude, we avoid the terms alien and discrepant. For Ambrose says that in the Father and the Son there is no discrepancy but one Godhead. And according to Hilary, as quoted above, in God there is nothing alien, nothing separable. To avoid the heresy of Sibelius, we must shun the term singularity, lest we take away the communicability of the divine essence. Hence Hilary says, it is sacrilege to assert that the Father and the Son are separate in Godhead. We must avoid the adjective only, lest we take away the number of persons. Hence Hilary says in the same book, we exclude from God the idea of singularity or uniqueness. Nevertheless, we say the only Son, for in God there is no plurality of sons. Yet we do not say the only God, for the deity is common to several we avoid the word confused, lest we take away from the persons the order of their nature. Hence Ambrose says, what is one is not confused, and there is no multiplicity where there is no difference. The word solitary is also to be avoided, lest we take away the society of the three persons. Whereas Hilary says, we confess neither a solitary nor a diverse God. This word other, however, in the masculine sense, means only a distinction of suppositum. 
and hence we can properly say that the son is other than the father because he is another suppositum of the divine nature as he is another person and another hypostasis reply to objection one other being like the name of a particular thing refers to the suppositum and so there is sufficient reason for using it where there is a distinct substance in the sense of hypostasis or person but diversity requires a distinct substance in the sense of essence thus we cannot say that the son is diverse from the father although he is another reply to objection two difference implies distinction of form there is one form in god as appears from the text who as he was in the form of god therefore the term difference does not properly apply to god as appears from the authority quoted yet damascene employs the term difference in the divine persons as meaning that the relative property is signified by way of form hence he says that the hypostases do not differ from each other in substance but according to determinate properties but difference is taken for distinction as above stated reply to objection three the term alien means what is extraneous and dissimilar which is not expressed by the term other and therefore we say that the son is other than the father but not that he is anything alien reply to objection four the neuter gender is formless whereas the masculine is formed and distinct and so is the feminine so the common essence is properly and aptly expressed by the neuter gender but by the masculine and feminine is expressed the determined subject in the common nature hence also in human affairs if we ask who is this man we answer socrates which is the name of the suppositum whereas if we ask who is he? what is he we reply a rational and mortal animal so because in god distinction is by the persons and not by the essence we say that the father is other than the son but not something else while conversely we say that they are one thing but not one person third article whether the exclusive word alone should be added to the essential term in god objection one it would seem that the exclusive word alone is not to be added to an essential term in god for according to the philosopher he is alone who is not with another but god is with the angels and the souls of the saints therefore we cannot say that god is alone objection two further whatever is joined to the essential term in god can be predicated of every person per se and of all the persons together for as we can properly say that god is wise we can say the father is a wise god and the trinity is a wise god but augustine says we must consider the opinion that the father is not true god alone therefore god cannot be said to be alone and objection three further if this expression alone is joined to an essential term it would be so joined as regards either the personal predicate or the essential predicate but it cannot be the former as it is false to say god alone is father since man also is father nor again can it be applied as regards the latter for if this saying were true god alone creates it would follow that the father alone creates as whatever is said of god can be said of the father and it would be false as the son also creates therefore this expression alone cannot be joined to an essential term in god on the contrary it is said to the king of ages immortal invisible the only god i answer that this term alone can be taken as a categorimatical term or as a syncategorimatical term a categorimatical term is one which ascribes absolutely its meaning to a given suppositum as for instance white to man as when we say a white man if the term alone is taken in this sense it cannot in any way be joined to any term in god for it would mean solitude in the term to which it is joined and it would follow that god was solitary against what is above stated a syncategorimatical term imports the order of the predicate to the subject as this expression every one or no one and likewise the term alone as excluding every other suppositum from the predicate thus when we say socrates alone writes we do not mean that socrates is solitary but that he has no companion in writing 
though many others may be with him. In this way, nothing prevents the term alone being joined to any essential term in God, as excluding the predicate from all things but God, as we, if we said God alone is eternal, because nothing but God is eternal. Reply to objection one, although the angels and the souls of the saints are always with God, nevertheless, if plurality of persons did not exist in God, he would be alone or solitary. For solitude is not removed by association with anything that is extraneous in nature. Thus, any one is said to be alone in a garden, though many plants and animals are with him in the garden. Likewise, God would be alone or solitary, though angels and men were with him, supposing that several persons were not within him. Therefore, the society of angels and of souls does not take away absolute solitude from God, much less does it remove respective solitude in reference to a predicate. Reply to Objection 2. This expression alone, properly speaking, does not affect the predicate which is taken formally, for it refers to the suppositum as excluding any other suppositum from the one which it qualifies. But the adverb only, being exclusive, can be applied either to subject or predicate, for we can say only Socrates, that is, no one else, runs, and Socrates runs only, that is, he does nothing else. Hence, it is not properly said that the Father is God alone, or the Trinity is God alone, unless some implied meaning be assumed in the predicate, as, for instance, the Trinity is God, who alone is God. In that sense, it can be true to say that the Father is that God, who alone is God, if the relative be referred to the predicate and not to the suppositum. So, when Augustine says that the Father is not God alone, but that the Trinity is God alone, he speaks expositively, as he might explain the words, to the King of ages, invisible, the only God, as applying not to the Father, but to the Trinity alone. Reply to Objection 3. In both ways can the term alone be joined to an essential term. For this proposition, God alone is Father, can mean two things because the word Father can signify the person of the Father, and then it is true, for no man is that person, or it can signify that relation only, and thus it is false, because the relation of paternity is found also in others, though not in a univocal sense. Likewise, it is true to say God alone creates, nor does it follow Therefore the Father alone creates, because, as logicians say, an exclusive diction so fixes the term to which it is joined that what is said exclusively of that term cannot be said exclusively of an individual contained in that term. For instance, from the premise, man alone is a mortal rational animal, we cannot conclude, therefore, Socrates alone is such. Fourth article, whether an exclusive diction can be joined to the personal term. Objection 1. It would seem that an exclusive diction can be joined to the personal term, even though the predicate is common. For our Lord, speaking to the Father, said, That they may know thee, the only true God. Therefore the Father alone is true God. Objection 2. Further, he said, No one knows the Son but the Father, which means that the Father alone knows the Son. But to know the Son is common to the persons. Therefore the same conclusion follows. Objection 3. Further, an exclusive diction does not exclude what enters into the concept of the term to which it is joined, since it does not exclude the part nor the universal, for it does not follow that if we say Socrates alone is white, that therefore his hand is not white, or that man is not white. But one person is in the concept of another, as the Father is in the concept of the Son, and conversely. Therefore, when we say the Father alone is God, we do not exclude the Son nor the Holy Ghost, so that such a mode of speaking is true. And objection 4. Further, the church sings, Thou alone art most high, O Jesus Christ. On the contrary, this proposition, the Father alone is God, includes two assertions, namely, that the Father is God, and that no other besides the Father is God. But the second proposition is false, for the Son is another from the Father, and He is God. Therefore this is false, the Father alone is God, and the same of the like sayings.
I answer that when we say the Father alone is God, such a proposition can be taken in several senses. If alone means solitude in the Father, it is false in a categorical sense. But if taken in a syncategorical sense, it can again be understood in several ways. For if it excludes all others from the form of the subject, it is true, the sense being the Father alone is God, that is, he who with no other is the Father is God. In this way Augustine expounds when he says, We say the Father alone, not because he is separate from the Son or from the Holy Ghost, but because they are not the Father together with him. This, however, is not the usual way of speaking unless we understand another implication as though we said, He who alone is called the Father is God. But in this strict sense, the exclusion affects the predicate, and thus the proposition is false if it excludes another in the masculine sense, but true if it excludes it in the neuter sense, because the Son is another person than the Father, but not another thing. And the same applies to the Holy Ghost. But because this diction alone, properly speaking, refers to the subject, it tends to exclude another person rather than other things. Hence such a way of speaking is not to be taken too literally, but it should be piously expounded whenever we find it in an authentic work. Reply to Objection 1. When we say, the, the only true God, we do not understand it as referring to the person of the Father, but to the whole Trinity, as Augustine expounds. Or, if we understood of the person of the Father, the other persons are not excluded by reason of the unity of essence, insofar as the word only excludes another thing, as above explained. The same reply can be given to objection too, for an essential term applied to the Father does not exclude the Son or the Holy Ghost by reason of the unity of essence. Hence, we must understand that in the text quoted the term no one, is not the same as no man, which the word itself would seem to signify, for the person of the Father could not be ex accepted. But it is taken according to the usual way of speaking in a distributive sense to mean any rational nature. Reply to Objection 3. The exclusive diction does not exclude what enters into the concept of the term to which it is adjoined, if they do not differ in suppositum as part and universal. But the Son differs in suppositum from the Father, and so there is no parity. And reply to objection 4. We do not say absolutely that the Son alone is most high, but that He alone is most high, with the Holy Ghost, in the glory of God the Father. The end of question 31.